Okay, the second section in this chapter is called Relative Motion. Um, it's really the second section, but it's really an application of the first chapter, which is uh, adding vectors and dealing with vectors. So this is kind of the first application that we'll look at. Um, I will say some of this will be done mathematically, and then some of it you have to just kind of get an intuition with um, from kind of practicing with these problems. And uh, But sometimes you have to look at it pure mathematically, and other times it's just... Uh, just getting uh, intuition. Uh, like the example that we'll use commonly is, so you have your kids here that are, you know, walking up the escalator. All right. If you were an outside observer, somebody over here looking, looking, you know, this way on, if that kid was going the exact same speed as the escalator, you would see that kid climbing, but at the same time you would see him not changing his position, not moving. And really what this is, is all about relativity, right? And not necessarily the Einstein version, but the Galileo version. Galileo was the first one to come up with relative motion and talk about how things can have to be relative to another, all right? So, um, so this is an example we'll use quite a bit. Uh, there's a, a music video by OK Go that I'll show in class that um, shows this kind of effect. All right, first we'll say that all motion is relative to a particular frame of reference. Um, and this is kind of like saying when um, we talked about relative to the origin, when we talked about displacement, you know, how many miles are you east or west of Chick-fil-A on 98, um, gives you a complete uh, idea. Well, we have to have some kind of motion that's relative to some kind of reference frame, some kind of uh, thing, right? And whatever that thing is, where that spot is, we say that that is not, you know, that is not uh, moving, essentially, and then we pretend that everything else is moving around it. Uh, this is also kind of the effect uh, you get when, um, you know, if you're sitting in a car, maybe at a red light or something, you're not quite looking out the window, and out of your periphery, you see the car, you know, next to you maybe move, and you get that kind of panic thinking that, you know, that, oh, I'm going backwards or something else like that. Um, but in reality, it's that car going forward. It's just, you know, your brain can get tricked that way. Um, any reference frame that is not accelerating can be used. For the most part, we won't come across this as any issues, but when we talk about centripetal motion, um, this will be important. Um, so it's not accelerating, which means it's not speeding up or slowing down, um, or it's not changing direction. Those are two key things. All right, so to determine the relative motion, we add or subtract the velocity vectors as needed. Now, if you want the pure mathematical way to approach this, then by all means read in the book. Um, what I'm going to discuss is more the intuitive way. Uh, for me, it's what helps, and I think the mathematical part is a little bit um, difficult when we actually get into add and subtract, and I think this way is uh, a little bit easier. So we have situation here, we have Amy who's standing, we got a runner at 5 meters per second, Bill at 5 meters per second, and then Carlos at 15. Um, both Bill, the runner, and Carlos are going in the same direction. Now, the question is, how fast is Bill going? Now, the idea is that that is an incomplete question. The real question should be relative to what? Because... If I say, you know, how fast is Bill going relative to Amy, right? I pretend basically, that's, and this is easy, I say Amy's not going anywhere, right? Uh, so if she's not going anywhere or she's in my reference, then what's Bill doing, all right? Bill is going five meters per second to the right faster than Amy, and that's zero essentially. But if I say what's Bill's speed relative to the runner, all right. Well, the runner's going relative to zero, whatever, five meters per second. These these two guys are going the same speed, right? So if I said the runner was my frame of reference and I concentrated, you know, from the runner's point of view, if the runner looked to the left, he would see Bill next to him in the exact same position throughout the entire time. So you could say that Bill had no speed, right? Relative to the runner, they're going the exact same speed. All right, and so they, there is no actually relative velocity. All right, if you're going side by side down the highway, both going 50 miles an hour with the car next to you, it's the same thing. If you're matching speed for speed, you know, exactly 50, all right, and you, and you blow.
blocked out the rest of the world all around you, the trees whizzing by, it'd be the exact same view as if you two were in the parking lot next to each other um, and you weren't moving at all. Okay? Um, so I could say that relative to Bill, relative to Amy is 5 meters per second to the right, but relative to the runner is actually 0, right? Uh, let's look at Carlos. Carlos is going 15 meters to uh, 15 meters per second to the right relative to Amy. Amy's not moving; she's stationary, so Carlos is going 15. But what is his velocity relative to Bill? Well, Bill is moving 5 meters per second to the right. Carlos is moving 15, right? So if I look at Bill and think about his point of view, he's going to see Carlos move away from him. So Carlos is still moving to the right, but he's not going to see at a rate of 15 meters per second. He's going to see something less. He's actually going to see Carlos move away from him at 10 meters per second, which is the difference between them. Now, this is best um, expressed when it's close. So imagine that, let's say, Bill's not going 5 meters per second. Bill's going 14 meters per second. All right, 14 meters per second, that's fast for a bike, but we'll just pretend. Now, he's going to see Carlos, if they start next to each other, he's going to see Carlos move away from him. But he's going to slowly move away from him, because he's only going one me uh, meter per second faster. All right? So he's only going one meter per second faster. So he's going to see Carlos slowly move away from him. And again, if Bill was going 5 meters per second, he's going to see it 10 meters per second. So that difference... You can see, you know, basically we're blocking out the rest of the world and saying, according to this one person as a frame of reference, what is the other object doing? And same thing with the runner. Whatnot. Now it gets a little complicated here because what if I said, uh, what is the runner's speed relative to Carlos? Okay, now we have to pretend that Carlos is stationary. Right? And if Carlos pretends that he's stationary and you block out the rest of the world around him and he can only see the runner and the runner's position relative to him, right? he's going to see the runner go backwards, which is odd. Yes, it is odd. He's going to see the runner go backwards. Right? Just, I mean, in his rear view mirror or whatever, whatever. But if we blocked out everything and he pretended that he was not moving, he would see the runner going backwards. And how fast would the runner be going backwards? At 10 meters per second. All right, so there is an actual mathematical way that you can be, you can use this to add or subtract. But what we're going to be doing is a little bit more in a logic way in the class. Okay, so, um, so this is where there's going to be some difficulty, uh, but hopefully we can practice and get through this. So let's look at an example here. You have a train. A person is on the train. Um, and throws a ball horizontal with a speed of 20 meters per second in the direction that the train is moving. Okay. The train is moving at 20 meters per second. So I'm going to say this is the train's motion, and that's 20 meters per second. There's a person that is on the train, and that person is throwing a ball at 20 meters per second in the direction that the train is going. Alright, so here's my ball right here. And it's going at 20 meters per second in the same direction. What is the initial velocity according to a stationary person outside of the train? So we get to be in our point of view right now. All right, our point of view. The train's going 20 meters per second. Somebody, if, if that person is holding the ball, and we just watch the train, the person, and the ball go by, we would say that the train, the person, and the ball are all going 20 meters per second. But the fact that now that he throws it an additional 20 meters per second in that direction, all right, if we saw that ball going, we would see actually that ball relative to us as a stationary person we pretend that we're stationary, which we are, um, I would see that ball going 40 meters per second, right? Because, because this velocity here is adding with this one, right? Now, let's pretend 
that the ball is going in the opposite direction. So I'll draw this again. Okay, here's the ball. It's being thrown in the opposite direction. A person, All right? Opposite direction at 20 meters per second. Okay. Now again, if the ball was not being thrown, it was just the person, if this wasn't happening, if the person was just standing there with the ball, then we would say that it would be 20 meters per second to the left. But now he throws it to the right at 20 meters per second. And so what he actually does is cancel out the velocity of the train. All right, the ball was going 20 meters per second to the left, according to us. But by him throwing it to the right, he canceled it out. So it's a strange thing that we would actually see the ball leave his hand and not move at all. The, bu the ball would basically, you know, according to us, would fall straight down. All right? There's a video that we'll show in class with Mythbusters and how they achieve this. All right? So this is an odd thing. They, they had a cancellation, right? Cancellation of the train speed by throwing the ball an equivalent in the opposite direction. Now we can think th further, and let's think about this um, from the uh, observation point of the person inside the train. So the person is inside the train, and we're going to pretend like all these windows, they're all blacked out, right? All these windows are blacked out. This person's inside the train, right? It's a smooth train, he can't feel any vibra vibrations or anything. So according to him, if he's just holding the ball, and he's my frame of reference, right? If he's just holding the ball and there's he has no sense of motion because everything, all the windows are blacked out, and there's no vibration. According to him, he says that I'm at rest, you know, that the that he's at rest and the ball is also at rest. He now throws the ball initially, let's say, uh, 20 meters per second to the left. According to him, what does he see? He sees the ball leave his hand at 20 meters per second, let's say, to the left. Right, so according to him, who he has no sense of the train's motion, and he's the frame frame of reference, he sees the ball going 20 meters per second to the left. Again, you could do this on a train, right? If you are on a train and you're throwing a baseball back and forth with somebody, right? According to you, you're throwing it at the exact same speed as if you're off the train. There's nothing that's, you know, there's nothing that gets kind of weird about it as long as the train's moving constant. And in, in the same way, back and forth, uh, going to right and left. And again, right here, also, he if he moves it, if he throws it to the right, again, he, according to him, he's stationary, so he sees the ball moving at 20 meters per second to the right. So the idea is that you get completely different answers, right? If you're an outside observer, right, I see this situation as 40 meters per second to the left, and I see this situation as zero to the uh, zero, right? And... But if I'm the inside observer, I see negative 20 meters per second or 20 meters per second to the left for the ball and 20 meters per second to the right for the ball. So your reference frame makes a difference in how you interpret motion. So the way we're going to analyze this is with vectors. Okay. So when we have to deal with two-dimensional, one-dimensional, it tends to be more reasoning. But two-dimensional, we have to be able to use vectors. So essentially we can have um, you know multiple vectors together that we can add and get some kind of relative motion to. Um, so two more vectors are going to be added together to create a um, result um, resultant relative motion. So so in this case um, if I have let's say uh, let's say velocity one this isn't a an airplane Right, that's moving to the right uh, with a certain velocity, 200 miles an hour. Uh, there's also a 15 mile an hour wind um, up, or let's say let's say the plane's moving to the east, and there's 15 mile wind to the north. What's the relative motion? Well, we know that in general, if the plane's trying to go east, right, and there's a wind this way, you know, there's going to end up like this. You're going to end up up at some angle. And so what we basically did was we just added uh, we just added these vectors okay and then we end up with a uh, resultant right 
resultant velocity here. So we're using the same skills as before. Again, if this was at this angle and then that angle, right, um, then this would be the resultant here. So we, we have, you know, th these are nice perpendicular ones, but, the, you know, we could also have uh, things at angles. So here's an example that we'll talk about in class. Um, a factory conveyor belt rolls at 3 meters per second, right, that's this way. And um, the mouse runs across at 4 meters per second. If you are, you know, from top view, or it says relative to the factory floor, the idea is it's not moving. But let's say you're in top view from some catwalk or something else like that. Uh, what would you see the mouse do? Well, if the, um, first you got to think about, if this was zero, right, if that conveyor belt was not moving at all, right, if I just cover this up, you know, and the idea is this was zero, you'd see the mouse just going at four meters per second across. But really what it ends up happening is the mouse, as he's moving across, also moves um, down, you know, down the belt too. So it ends up actually moving in this, like this kind of motion, relative to a stationary person. He is both crossing and moving this way at the same time, so he ends up some combination of the two. So how do I do that? Well, I represent that with, okay, four meters per second here, three, well, a little bit long for three, but either way, three meters per second this way, my resultant is right here. Um, and this is a 90, again, again, this is across and this is down, so this is a 90 degree angle uh, perpendicular to each other. And what kind of triangle do I have? I have a three, four, five triangle. So the answer would be E, five meters per second. Okay, so now we got a problem here. And if you look at it, we have the exact same steps and everything as we did before in adding vectors. Now we just have a situation. Essentially, what we're going to be doing this when we have relative motion with the two dimensions, we'll just be adding vectors. So an airplane leaves Chicago going um, 15 degrees north of east at 50 mile, 500 miles an hour. The wind is blowing south at 100 miles an hour. Right, what's the velocity of the plane relative to the ground? Um, so let's, let's again, just um, uh, graphically, let's add these together. So 15 degrees north of east is something like this. All right, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I'll zoom in. This is 15 degrees north of east. And then the um, this is 500. And um, then it's basically, what is it, 100 miles per hour south at 100 miles per hour. Okay, so I'm now going to draw south at 100 miles an hour. So south and then it needs to be about one-fifth length, so something like this. And that's just roughly 100, and that's due south. There's no angle to it. So the resultant is going to be, um, you know, some, some value, let's say, that's at this angle right there, All right? So let's see how we can find it. I'm going to do a step-by-step, -step, but I'll be doing the work um, and then pause it along the way to keep the video short. Step one, break down each vector into its x and its y components. Okay, now I've represented each vector that we have, um, 500 miles per hour, 15 degrees north of east, and 100 miles per hour south. Uh, the easy one to do, of course, is the b vector right there, um, the x component. Well, what is the x component? That x component is basically zero. Uh, what is the y component? Well, that is 100 degree, 100 miles per hour um, south, which will be negative 100. Okay, that's the easy one. Uh, next, I'm going to go up here and use sine and cosine to find my um, a vector uh, components. Okay, now I found my uh, x components, um, and these are values of miles per hour. I checked that my uh, things make sense, and yes, my x value should be much greater than my y value, and they should both be positive. Next, I need to take these, and I need to plug them into my table. Okay, so I'll do that. Okay, now I've plugged them in. I've added up my x values. I've added up my y values. 
Again, the positives and negatives are very important, so we must keep track of those. I now have a resultant um, x and resultant of y that I can now build a master triangle. Okay, so 483 and 29.4 are my values. So let's build this triangle now. All right, so I have x value 483. 483. Okay, and I have a y value that is a very, very, very small positive 29.4. 29.4. Okay, and essentially what I'm going to be doing is finding a resultant. So what should my resultant look like? Well, one, it should be pretty close in value to 483, um, but should be greater than, and it should have a very low angle for that. So now we get to apply Pythagorean theorem and um, an inverse tangent to find those values. Okay, using Pythagorean theorem, in those two values I find a uh, value of 483.89 miles per hour, or roughly about 484 miles per hour. Next, I'm going to use the tangent to find the angle. Okay, so now I have an angle here of 3.48 degrees north of east. So I can go back and say, does that make sense? If I look at my resultant here, yes, it should be a small angle, and it should be barely uh, more than my um, this, and this should be, you know, this value right here should be barely more than my x component, because it's mostly x. And then if I go back to my initial prediction here, um, yeah, so I, I probably drew my vectors a little bit, you know, different here. If this one was a little bit shorter, then it would have been essentially this one right here. So overall, I'm happy with that, and I think I have a correct answer. Okay, next example, I have a flock of ducks. They're trying to migrate south, but they keep on being blown off course by wind to the east at 12 meters per second. All right, they decide they must angle themselves in order to fly due south. All right, so if you think about it, if the wind is blowing due east and they have to angle themselves in order to go south, they're going to have to cut into the wind. All right, and we kind of know this kind of intuitively. So if I were to draw that real quick, what would that look like? Essentially, if they want to go you know, due south, the wind is blowing this way, right, they're going to have to go off in this direction, right, so we kind of have to use some intuition there. And so essentially what's going to happen is they're going to go off in that direction, the wind's going to blow, um, the wind's going to blow in that direction, in this direction here, and then the resultant's going to be that they go right here. All right, so this is what we're going to be doing and setting up in this problem. So let's get rid of a whole bunch of this. Okay. Um, ducks can fly 16 meters per second relative to the air. Basically, that is their speed that they can fly. Uh, anytime you see that, it says relative to the air, relative to the water. Essentially, uh, if there was no wind, if there was no uh, current, if it's water, then that's their kind of max speed that they can do. And it says, in what direction should they uh, head in order to fly due south? And then what is the speed relative to the ground? So let me bring that up, um, what I just did, and I'm going to draw that a little bit cleaner um, with the vectors, and so that's what we're going to use. Okay, now I've set this up. The idea is that the ducks are going to head into the wind. Here's my wind blowing east. In order for them to go due south and have this resultant here, ducks are going to have to cut in to the wind. Uh, so you have the speed of the ducks, basically the velocity of the ducks, VD, and they're going to have to go at some angle here, okay, and so and cut into the wind, so they end up with that due south resultant there. So we're still going to deal with this in a very similar way. The idea is that uh, this is a 90 degree angle right here, and we still can use um, some of this information. So the first question says, uh, what is the direction that they must go into the wind? Well, first of all, I, let's extract some of this information. It says that they can fly 16 meters per second relative to the air. Now, that's 16 meters per second if there was no wind or anything else like that. So, essentially, that's the speed of the ducks. So, this is 16 meters per second. Okay. Uh, we also know that the wind is going 12 meters per second to the east. 
that means the speed of the wind is 12 meters per second. All right, and we know that they're going to end up with this uh, south, due south direction right here, due south direction. So what does this angle have to be? Well, um, I don't really have to do anything fancy. I can just kind of look at this. Um, I have an angle right here. I have an opposite, and I have a hypotenuse. So if I have an opposite and a hypotenuse, then I can use sine. So let's find that. So I say sine of the angle is equal to my opposite, which is 12, divided by my hypotenuse, which is 16. Okay, that means theta equals inverse sine 12 divided by 16. Inverse sine 12 divided by 16 gives me an angle of 48 point roughly 6 degrees. All right, now I got to think about what this angle represents. Um, uh, basically, I start from south, and it's going 48.6 degrees west of south, and so that's what I will represent and say west of south. Okay. Now the next question is: What is the speed? What is the speed relative to the ground? Okay. Now, if it was um, you know, I see the 16, you can't say 16 meters per second, because let's say that they were at a greater angle like this, right, or greater, or greater, or maybe even this way, all the way due left. Well, if they were going 16 meters per second this way, and the wind was going 12 meters per second that way, you know that there would be only about 4 meters per second that they would be having, you know, kind of a net speed to the left. So we still have that same kind of effect here. Um, so, what we need to know is uh, what is this velocity, you know, resultant velocity here from these two. Alright, so what I need to do is I need to break up this into an x and into a y component. Alright, add up my x's and add up my y's. So let's do that. Alright, let's take each segment and then uh, analyze it. Okay, as you can see, I've drawn my a vector right here and um, split it up into an x and into a y. Remember, you have to assign the negative values for each one. And then I have my b vector here, and I've split that up into a uh, x and into a y. So, um, again, this is kind of simple here. It's no y component, and I'm just going east 12. And what you find is it makes sense because we we found this angle based off of the idea of canceling, um, is that my x component is negative twelve and my x component of this one is positive twelve. So when they go over the table, they are going to cancel each other, and all the only thing I have left is my y component. So let's go see that. Okay, so I've plugged in the values, I've added up my columns, and again I get basically the only thing that's left over is resultant of negative or basically I've drawn I don't need negative I've drawn to the left of uh, oops sorry never mind back up this is a y so I draw it down uh, let's take a straight down as much straight as I can of 10.58 and this is in miles per hour or is it or is it meters per second let me go back let me see which one is it Yep, meters per second, sorry. So, so I need to draw that again. And so 10.58 meters per second. Okay, and this is my second answer. And so it says, what is the, you know, uh, speed relative to ground? 10.58 meters per second. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, you could have probably just used Pythagorean theorem from this one. Um, but again, if this if this angle right if this wind right here wasn't due east, then you'd have an issue, uh, and then this is the proper way to to go about it. Okay, this next one is a bridging slide. A bridge slide will connect us from relative motion into projectile motion, which is in the next section. So let's say you're on a train. The train is moving twenty meters per second to the left. So here's my train. And this is 20 
meters per second. All right, so somebody is on the train. And this is a very big person on the train, but you get the idea. And they're throwing a ball up into the air. All right, so this ball is being thrown up into the air. Uh, we know from um, we know from our projectile motion, not projectile, our uh, free fall that's going to go up and then down. But let's think about this in a relative motion standpoint. Uh, what's the initial velocity according to a stationary person outside the train? All right, so let's say in this value was given, uh, we have here at um, you know, 10 meters per second. Okay, so relative to somebody outside the train, uh, well, we just had that from our last kind of chapter. We said, okay, well, I can use um, I can use vector addition. So if I were to draw my vectors over here to have 10 meters per second up, we're just talking about initial. We're not talking about you know as it travels, and then 20 meters per second this way. All right. So I'm combining velocities just the same way that we have before. All right. The train's moving 20, the ball's moving whatever, so I'm going to have some kind of resultant that comes out of this. And this is what I would see as an initial velocity by combining those two, resultant velocity. All right. So basically, that's the same thing as if this ball, if this train was stopped, not moving, it's the same thing as this ball being tossed instead of, instead of straight up, but, you know, at some angle. Okay. Because it has both initial velocity in y and initial velocity in, in, in x. So we would see it follow this projectile path, all right, this parabola. Now this is the weird part, because relative to the person inside the car, again, if they were inside this train, all the windows were blacked out, um, you know, you throw a ball up in the air, as long as the train isn't speeding up or slowing down, that ball is going to come right back down in your hand. It's not going to go shooting across the train car uh, in some parabola. In parabola, if you just throw it straight up, it's going to go straight up according to you, and it's going to go back down, straight back down into your hand according to you. All right? If you had no sense of anything going on in the outside world, that's what happens. All right? So we have two different reference frames and two different uh, ways of looking at things, and in a way, this is going to be our bridge concept between the two, um, between relative motion and uh, between projectile motion. Because really what we're going to be talking about is how our you know, x component is completely independent from our y component.